Well, just about 35 miles southwest of Cleveland sits the town of Oberlin, which was built around the Liberal Arts College of the same name. The town also contains the Oberlin Conservatory of Music, which has for over 120 years produced well-trained and finely skilled musicians. For most of those 120 years, a respected and important part of their musical heritage has come from the sights and sounds of the organs of Oberlin. Tonight, we take you on a tour of these magnificent instruments in stereo. It has a classic collegiate atmosphere. The town is small and quiet. The students are serious and applied. Of the 500 or so conservatory students, only a handful, 17 this year, are organ majors. However, when one plays the organ, numbers are meaningless. Junior organ student, Fred Lawson. Playing an organ is a little bit like being a conductor of an orchestra. You get to choose what sounds you want, where they come in. Um, it's the closest thing to being a one-man band is playing the organ. department chairman Haskell Thompson explains the essentials. Organs come in such various sizes and shapes and historical styles, but the one thing they share in common is that they're all wind instruments played from a keyboard. So there is always a wind supply, some sorts of sounds, rows of pipes that make different tones, and some sort of key mechanism to bring the wind to the pipes so that the sounds are created. Here on the Oberlin campus are three distinctly different styles of concert organs. Located in Finney Chapel is an excellent example of the American classic style, which is best suited for music of the late 19th and 20th centuries. One of Oberlin's three organ professors, Garth Peacock, recounts one historical footnote about an instrument which has origins predating the birth of Christ. We usually associate organ with church for good reason. But it's only relatively recent, relatively recent in the history of the instrument, that it was accepted by the church. It was considered a secular instrument. Uh, well, for example, we know that uh, in Roman times, uh, when gladiators, that is, in, when they were in the arena, the what we would probably come closer to calling a calliope would sound the signal for the gladiator to make the kill. Hello, Krista. Hello, Jonathan. <laughs> Hi, David. And Krista. Uh, you know, that video was so, uh, so amazing. I attended Oberlin from 1970 to 1975. And this video was from 1983, David, is that right? I believe so, yes. 83. And so to me, it was it was like an update. <laughs> but I, I, I remember so well walking along those snowy streets past the con and 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 the treasures that awaited us inside. Um, I was uh, I was a student of Garth Peacock and uh, I studied uh, with him from 70 to 75. And this, the spring semester of 1974, we said goodbye, we walked, went home for the summer. Uh, and then when we came back in the fall, the Flentrop was in Warner Concert Hall. Before that, there'd been a big Holt camp that spread the whole width of the, of the front of the stage. And uh, I remember in September when I first walked into Warner Concert Hall and saw that Flentrop. I, I, I literally burst into tears. It was so beautiful. And it was so much more overwhelming, so much more majestic than what I had expected. Because we knew it was going to be a Flentrop, and we knew the Flentrop studio organs and the practice organs, and they were all natural wood, they weren't painted. And uh, they were just very plain and kind of, kind of stark. But when you walked into Warner Concert Hall and saw this thing that was uh, raspberry red and that gorgeous deep blue color, um, it was, it, and, and just stand, standing there in its, in its majesty, you oh, knew oh. before you even heard it how gorgeous it was gonna be. And what an impressive <laughs> We seem to have that same tradition going on, uh, David. Just a couple of summers ago, you know, 
Yes. Uh, you moved another organ here to campus. It, it, we, we moved, uh, it's hard to believe, three years ago. Uh, Greg Harold's Opus 11, which has become the Fenner Douglas Memorial Organ. Uh, Harold, the uh, Los Angeles organ builder, um, who uh, was commissioned by UC Berkeley to recreate uh, the Spanish organs of, of the uh, late 17th, early 18th centuries um, in, in one, one instrument. And uh, we were very fortunate to acquire that organ for the collection at Oberlin. It's, it's amazing, Krista, to watch that video, um, which is before my time, even as a student. I was uh, here as a student from 1994 until 1999 studying with, with uh, the beloved late David Bowe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, remember my time there and, and Haskell Thompson uh, uh, was also with the faculty then and uh, Haskell's presence was felt by all. Uh, and it, it, it studied improvisation at the organ and the keyboard skills courses and the organ literature, history and design courses. So it was a team effort of, of both of them in that time period. Um, and you know, we were anticipating the arrival of another new creation uh, as a when I was a student. Um, I remember vividly being taken around on the tour of Oberlin um, the weekend I came to audition. It was, it was a rough winter, the winter of 94. My parents and I drove out from New Jersey across northern Pennsylvania and we were in between snowstorms. So we got to Oberlin, stayed at the old Oberlin Inn, um, and Oberlin was a winter wonderland. And I remember my, my father kind of incredulous that we were going out to a concert because it was snowing pretty heavily. And we were like, yeah, we'll just walk. And so we walked over to Finney Chapel, and the place was packed for a student orchestra concert early in February. And um, so that, the, the scenes in that video of the snow, that's a, that's a good thing. We sit on a beautiful, well, I sit on a beautiful sunny day in Oberlin uh, uh -huh. uh, to talk about that. But I was, I remember being told as we did that tour of the organs um, that, oh, you're so lucky, you'll get to play your senior recital on the new Fisk. Um, oh, right. And at that point, in Fisk's building uh, output, they had about a five or six year wait. So even though the contract was signed, it was still some time before. This was ready, Finney Chapel was ready, and um, but I, 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 um, I, I guess my notoriety is I, I'm officially the last Oberlin student to play upon the Aeolian Skinner. Um, wow. Baccalaureate uh, in May of 1999, hit general cancel and turned it off. <laughs> and wow. Later, the, uh, Goulding and Wood arrived to dismantle the organ and um, prepare it for its its new home, which is now out in Sedona, Arizona. My class was the first to play their senior recitals on the Flentrop. I think I was like the third or fourth concert. I remember the first was David Blazer, my, my classmate, and I was envious. <laughs> he got to be first. I came here after uh, both of you. I uh, moved here to Ohio in 2008 and had my first introduction to Oberlin in 2009. So, but even in the last 11 years, I've seen two new instruments come here, smaller size, but wonderful nonetheless. The uh, beautiful instrument that came from the home of David Bow, that was uh, given to the school and put in the front of Fairchild Chapel. And I had the distinct honor of playing the dedication of that, that organ in 2016. And of course, David and Sigrid were both here, and John Bromval, the builder of the organ. And it was, it was an evening I will never, ever forget. Mm -hmm. I, I remember there was this moment at the end of the program. Most people had left, and uh, David was in a wheelchair. But he stood up, and he, and he walked down the aisle a little bit, and John Bromval was there with him. I was at the front, kind of putting my music away. And I looked over, and... Uh, John just looked right into David's eyes and just said, you have done some remarkable things in your life. And it was just seeing that the organ in the background and them, well, the two of them in that space that were such a part of the inspiration behind 
the instruments in that room yeah was just it just was just seared into my memory and my heart forever so i was just so glad to be there at that moment and just you know, to realize that we are a part of a such a, a great legacy of so many people that have been a part of this story of these yeah. instruments. I mean, the instruments represent people. Mm -hmm. Generations of students that have practiced on them, generations of teachers that who have taught on them. And, uh, you know, it's going to live on. And, and it's right. our job right now to be the, the stewards of it yes. and, and to prepare it for the next generation even better than it is now and so that they are more equipped to keep it alive. Um, and that's, of course, like the, uh, the energy, the impetus behind this next initiative we're doing with a whole series of videos on, on the collection itself that are gonna be really engaging demonstrations, but interviews, um, kind of documentary uh, information about the instruments themselves. Um, we're starting out with five initial videos on the main instruments that we've done. Uh, of course, Fairchild, uh, the two organs of Warner, and then Finney and Peace Church. Uh, but then following this, we're hoping to create more. And I'd love to, of course, Krista, we want to have your perspective on the collection and get some presentations of you. And I'd love to see other like shorter videos from our students kind of showing student perspectives yes, yes. so we can interview our students on the organs and talk to them about what it feels like to play couperin in uh warner or even on the, the new greg harold organ of course that's our newest member of the family uh, which david so lovingly moved here across the United States. And, and what, what, what an addition that is. And when you look at the two instruments now in Warner, the big one in the front and the small one in the back, uh, small one's not so small uh, and has, has its own platform back there. But uh, uh, what, a, what, a, what a stunning uh, contrast and play off one another they have. Um, the Greg Harold organ originally built in 1988 and then uh, having just had its uh, introductory year, its dedicatory year last year, uh, just what a wonderful, year. what a year, what a year, uh, culminating in Guy Beauvais' wonderful concert. Yeah, I mean, despite COVID, you think about all that we packed in and right. the personalities that came here. Yes. Uh, um, Kimberly Marshall. Kimberly Marshall. Robert Bates. Bates. Jean-Baptiste Robin was here, you know, in between teaching French. Jean-Baptiste Robin, right, right. And then, and then the concerts that you and I gave, Jonathan, I just, I, I loved your concert. And it, you were so clever in using both instruments at the same time. You had, a, you had a student playing the flentrop in the front as you played the Greg Harold organ in the back. What, a, what, what an event. I, clearly, Warner Concert Hall had never seen anything like that. No, no. I hope we'll have more of it. And then Krista, your collaborative music with Kathy Mines oh. was just so, so wonderful. And, and she's an icon herself. And to have her uh, finishing up her career by kicking off a new instrument in Warner, it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful event. So David, if you could uh, give us just an update of where we are with the collection now, it's always been evolving, but uh, where is it today? The collection of pipe organs that the conservatory and the college own um, is, is a healthy one. Uh, we're, we're always looking at, well, how can we describe this collection? Is it the world's largest? Is, uh, there are certainly denominations of churches that would count all the organs as having more. So what we are proud of saying is we have the world's most distinguished organ collection made up of 28 instruments owned by the college with the churches, the students of Oberlin have an unprecedented 32 instruments to access while here in Oberlin. For the breakdown of all that, that's 12 practice instruments, six concert instruments, three studio organs, and seven continuo or chamber instruments that all actively take a role in, in our teaching, in our performance, uh, in our studies, in our practice. I did the count once, it's 
something over, I haven't found the number, I need to add them up again, but it's something, if you take all the pipes together, it's something like 14,000 some odd pipes. It's amazing. And it's, sometimes I just try to imagine how this all happened. And it, I mean, obviously there was a great deal of energy and thought into, and care for these instruments, but it truly is miraculous. Well, and it's, and it's smart, you know, really smart people put this together one step at a time. Uh, and the acquisition of any organ, as anybody who's ever been involved in it knows, is, is, is fraught with the possibility of error. Wrong turns can happen anywhere. Uh, but the, the people guiding this process, uh, David Bow in particular has to be mentioned here, uh, just really knew what they were doing. They were, they were smart, they were knowledgeable, and they had a commitment to Oberlin and to excellence. And they just did the best they could with what they had. They had good resources and they, good job. Yes. Several hundred yards from Finney Chapel is the acoustically pleasing Fairchild Chapel. In it is housed a second classic instrument which also has a distinct style of construction and sound. It too is best suited to a specific era of musical compositions. David Bow, Conservatory of Music Dean, explains the circumstances behind Oberlin's second concert organ. In designing this organ, we uh, wanted to have an instrument that would be particularly good for early music. And we looked to a prototype instrument from uh, the 17th century on which to base this organ. John Brumbaugh was chosen as the builder. Uh, he's an American builder who has had uh, much success uh, building instruments uh, in uh, the North European style. While this instrument is not a direct copy of a specific 17th century organ, it incorporates many identical design and decorative elements. Not only is it beautifully handcrafted and painted, including delicate gold leaf inlays, it is capable of being powered or winded by the original foot pedal method, if the organist decides not to use the instrument's electrically powered blower. goes back, Krista, I was thinking as you were talking about your memories of the arrival of the Flendtrop, that here we are, not to give away a, a number, but we're approaching the Flendtrop's 50th anniversary in 2024. And the Flendtrop is really the uh, seminal instrument that started the collection growing into his work. Um, uh, so many uh, nationally specific building styles. Uh, uh, the, from that, from that first organ, we we've, we've grown to be able to walk around Tappan Square and uh, walk through time and space and and places that you'd have to get on a plane and go over to Europe and travel around different cities to see and touch and hear all these unique uh, national examples. And here we have it in one space. So. The Flentrop gets us going, and then it's amazing. 20-year intervals, we seem to have uh, great things occurring. Across the quadrangle from Fairchild Chapel is Oberlin's Warner Concert Hall. It houses the third and perhaps most prized concert organ, again Haskell Thompson. This is a typical Baroque organ of the early 18th century. Uh, Northern European style. Now that's just to say it's in the style of that. This organ was actually put here in 1974. It was installed here in 1974, but it's built in the style of the 18th century Northern European organs.
Oberlin's development of this collection really parallels the reforms and renewal that took place in this country. Um, I remember reading, uh, well, actually there's a, there's a new book out now on the life of Arthur Poister by David Pickering. It's a great, and the first, the opening part of the book is a great description of his time here at Oberlin. And um, Arthur Poister, even at the time, now uh, we might disagree with some of his, his ideas today, but nevertheless, you know, it was a part of that re initial reform and they, you know, completely redesigned the old E.M. Skinner organ that was in Finney. Uh, we would love to have it back now, but I mean, the sentiment behind that reform was it laid the groundwork then for the work that take place in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, the next generation, especially Fenner's work in getting the Flentrop here, I think you know, that whole reform, it's a century long process. And um, I know Bruce Falks speaks so eloquently about how he knows the work that he does today is as a result of those reforms. Even if they were slightly misguided or or didn't have the complete picture, not misguided is the wrong word, but the didn't have the complete picture or the resources of how to build these um, authentic and historic copies we have today. Um, it's just it's just an amazing, amazing story, amazing history. You know, back in the 70s, when uh, discussion just first began about uh, getting rid of the whole camp and acquiring a new instrument for Warner Concert Hall. There was a little contingent of students, East Coasters, who, uh, who, who knew about uh, the Fisk organ at Old West Church, which had just been installed in Boston in 1971, Opus 55. Yes. And there was a contingent of students that were agitating for a Fisk. We wanted a Fisk. We wanted an American organ builder. And Fisk had just done this miraculous thing uh, at, at Old West. And no, no, those stodgy old faculty decided it was going to be Flentrop. And so Flentrop it was. And to think that uh, a couple of decades later, the Fisk organ did come to Oberlin. <laughs> so... And then Mean Tone. I remember at the Westfield conference this past October, uh, Pamela Reuter Feenstro talking about in the early 80s when the uh, Fisk organ went into uh, Wellesley. This, this first major quarter comma mean tone with sub semitone, a first instrument of its kind in the US, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. um, and she said this was like a disease that you got, you got the mean tone. Uh, Fever. You know, bacteria and it grew in you and <laughs> Me <it>, <laughs> fever. <laughs> yeah, really. And then it came to Oberlin in this absolutely mir miracle of an instrument in Fairchild Chapel. Oh. Uh, Harold Fogel yeah. proclaimed the greatest uh, authentic reconstruction of a historic years. organ in the 20th century. Period. I mean it's it is a miracle. It's just a miracle. Many things have changed in the collection, but we, we have we have evidence of how history has tracked it uh, uh, over time. Um, there are many artifacts that we can look at. This this wonderful uh, book on the centenary of the conservatory in, uh, in the eighties. Nineteen eighty two is the copyright. This is the Gasparo. This is an LP for anyone who maybe doesn't know what an LP is. It's not just an overgrown CD. Um, but that, that featured everything we had to that point. Um, there's Stephen Schnur's book, The Organs of Oberlin, which acts a wonderful history. I'll try to not show it in the reflected light. Um, history of the organs going back to the 19th century. Um, and we've just finished a project of recording 
these new videos that shows everything today as of, as of current times. So we're excited to show those. Um, it, well, if, if you're right now, when everyone's going to see this, we'll, we'll be in the middle of the Organ Academy, but um, perhaps you two want to talk about the Organ Academy. Well, of course, plans really changed for this year. We were going to have, of course, a really engaging on-campus experience with some alumni coming back. We had invited Bob and Vicki Sirota and David Hurd, all distinguished alumni. Um, and of course, those plans got changed. Hopefully, we can do it next summer um, with them. But we're, we put together a really engaging um, week of online studies through Zoom lessons, classes, and uh, we're going to have, it's all going to uh, come to a big climax tomorrow night with our live uh, streaming concert from the different organs. Um, I'll be playing from Fairchild and Finney and... I'll be playing from Warner, both ends. Yes. <laughs> so, and David will be making sure that everything is working and functioning <laughs> all places at all times. <laughs> I'm just the you know, curator cam where I just run around and, <laughs> and tune. Yeah, it'll be so fun. David, just for the, you know, the, I think it's good just to repeat, you know, obviously um, Professor Rakic and I have the great honor of engaging with our students and I know you do as well, uh, but we're teaching, we're um, constantly thinking about how repertory um, inspires uh, our students and ourselves on these different instruments. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about what do you do here at Oberlin? What does a curator of organs do? A curator of organs, it's, it's a jack of all trades kind of position. You know, you have to be prepared to do fix things as, as user interface wears them down or accidents happen and things break. Um, a lot of it is also just interfacing with the facilities in which the organs live. Um, you know, maintaining uh, temperature and humidity as best as you can. Um, some of these instruments don't uh, exist in uh, rooms that have a 24-7 HVAC system, so like Finney and Fairchild and Peace Church. Come summertime, you have to contend with heat and humidity changing um, as the weather changes. Uh, a lot of it is just, you know, going around listening and being aware of, of what's in tune, what's not, making sure that uh, the students and the faculty recognize that it's a bit of, if you see something, say something. With, with 28 instruments, it's not always possible on a daily basis to go to every one of them and know what's not working as it should. Um, preparing for things like long-term maintenance of the facilities. Just four years ago, uh, Bibbins uh, completed uh, the final stage of, of, of restoring the front building of the conservatory and we had to move both Flentrop studio instruments out of Bibbins so they could gut the spaces to the walls and it was an interesting study because I think the those those guys from Zondam came over and they built it in place and there was no thought that someone would have to take it apart and um, that was a lot of head scratching. It was definitely a learning curve on the organ in Krista's office, which we caught up with ourselves when we got to Jonathan's office. So, so David, I will say th there is one of the great things about having a curator here. It's like having our own personal 911 line. If whenever <laughs> there's a problem, there's nothing more wonderful than to get on the phone and say, David, what's going on with the organ? Can you come and fix it now? <laughs> David, the coupler's stuck. <laughs> we need the red bat phone at every organ, so we can <laughs> <to> David <laughs> uh, You know, we, we, I encourage the students, it's okay to text me if they discover something. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a triage situation. Is something on fire? Okay, call me late at night um, you know if it's something that it can wait till the morning it's okay to text or send a message but don't assume that you know I'm aware of something and it's okay to get six messages from six different people saying hey did you know that you know the pedal board's fallen off uh, so, uh, 
it's, it's, you know, it's, I, I, I sometimes describe my, um, my work here as being like a, a family practice physician. You know, you have, you have newborns, you, you, you have adolescents, you have geriatrics. Uh, you, as long as no one is in palliative care, I'm doing my job. Well, I mean, I, we all come through with these just great personal interactions with the collection. And uh, Professor Rakic, I would just love to hear from you about what it's been like for you to come back. I mean, it's certainly on our end of things, it's been such a blessing to have you here. And, oh, thanks. Um, um, not only are you a wonderful teacher, but um, you bring a great perspective um, from uh, your time here as a student, and now you're back. I know. It's so wonderful to be back. There's a way in which I feel like I never left. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. I just walked into Bibbins and, uh, oh yeah, this is, uh, th this is what I need to do next. And it, it, it sliding into the routine of things was amazingly easy. And um, when I was a student here, the atmosphere of learning was so intense and I thrived on it so much. Uh, and I've treasured that over the years since I've been away. And then coming back, it was like, it was like taking another big sip out of the Oberlin goodness. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it was wonderful. And, it's, and uh, not only are the students fantastic and immensely interesting to work with, but also my own growth as a musician has just been spurred by being surrounded by this environment of, of constant exploration and constant expansion and constant learning. It's, uh, you know, o Oberlin is a wonderful place and uh, it, it, I've held it deep in my heart for many, many years. It was really a place where I first blossomed, not only as a musician, but also as a person. And, and coming back, I, I was pleasantly surprised and, and thrilled to find that another growth spurt is possible. And I think that's, in a way, the essence of Oberlin. There's always another growth spurt just waiting to burst forth. And uh, it bursts forth in, in various students at various times. And even after you leave here, you, you, you retain that memory of infinite possibility. There's always something you haven't thought of yet, something you haven't realized yet. And uh, to me, that's the essence of Oberlin. And, and um, it's, it's, it's really been a homecoming for me to be back here and to be reliving some of those, some of those joys. Plus the students are fantastic. You, you, it, the best students in the world are here. <laughs> they are. I mean, really, we have some remarkable kids and they, they're just, uh, I don't know how many lessons I've, I leave just being inspired myself. I learn more sometimes than the student, I think. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it is such a, a wonderful relationship we share. I mean, we bring our experiences, but then they often turn around and just, fill us with really insightful music making yes get us thinking differently and that kind of relationship is just really really important mm, priceless priceless yeah. yes i can i can recall one morning one morning having a 9 a.m lesson in finney and it was not good weather and i trudged over to finney and took off my raincoat and could hear the organ playing upstairs and hauled it up the stairs, not really feeling much in the mood. And uh, the student sat down and played me this Franck piece. And I was so moved and so taken aback. It was not, it was not the excellence, the, the exquisite music making that I was expecting. Shame on me. But I had to. I had to ask her for a moment <laughs> to collect myself, because it, it, to be to be moved by excellent music making in moments where you may or may not expect it is is another one of the of the joys of Oberlin. Yeah, you know, because it makes me think as our role as teachers. Sometimes we come into it always thinking about so how are we going to guide the students to correct this or to. Um, to right. think of another interpretation or 
these other considerations. And sometimes there's just the realization that this is beautiful now and, and you have achieved mm -hmm. something remarkable and let's move on. And it, we confirm you did the right thing, you know? And I think we get that a lot yes. here, thankfully. So. Yes, we do. We get that a lot here. And, uh, and we also get in, in each player, the, the, the soul of a musician. And it's our job as teachers to release that soul. Mm -hmm. Anything that's blocking that student's self-expression so that they can really be themselves at the keyboard. And uh, it's, it, it's just a joy and an enormous honor to participate in that process, to be a, to be a witness to it, to be a, to be a catalyst for it. It's, it's great. It's just wonderful. Yeah. One of the great things about being back is the subtle changes that have occurred in the 25 years or the 50 years since we were students and you know, now interacting with the students that you know of today and uh, one really great thing is both studios gather together for our weekly departmental master class and everyone's playing for each other and that that collegiality which is essential in all things in what we do not in organ but throughout music throughout life um, learning that supporting each other um, having fun together uh, but growing, that, that's that been a, a, a wonderful thing to see. And, um, you know, from the standpoint of someone who whose job it is to, you know, make sure that everything's ready to go, you know, that the instrument doesn't impede <laughs> the artistic expression. It's it's wonderful to see the journey of, of students, whether it's just week to week, over the course of a semester, and you know to be in the class and, and to hear what people are playing because I know you know when it comes time for that junior recital yeah they're using this solo sound in a particular way do I check the instrument do I prepare the organ in a different way than just you know a generic run through so it's you know engaging with the music from the from the um, interface of how is the instrument playing for the particular piece of repertoire we're about to hear in a recital and, and that that, that helps color my assessment of the organs. Yes, and uh, you know, following on what you said uh, uh, just now, David, the, the organs are really the best teachers here. And having such fine instruments uh, accessible to our students and ourselves ha has made everyone better, I think. And I, I'm, always, I'm always surprised by um, new registration combinations that students come up with, or oh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought of that. Mm -hmm. uh, that that occurs fairly often, and uh, hearing these fine instruments used in, in in an array of different ways by an array of different students is uh, is really enlightening as well. You know, so as we think of the collection now. I've often begun to view it almost as like a, as a, just a beautiful art collection. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we have the honor of, of treasuring it, of taking care of it and steward and being stewards of it. And now it's up to us to really make sure it is available for another generation and for the future. And I think that's really the heart behind this um, whole series of videos and our, our thoughts about how we can engage more people with the collection. I mean, that's the future. And um, I think about um, right now, of course, it, it it's such an, it's nucleus at its heart is our education for our undergrads. It's there for them to practice on, they're performing on it, they're growing on it. And its pedagogical purpose is central, but we do need to expand and we need to find ways to expand our degree programs, um, but just to find more uh, ways to engage the world with it. I mean, we're starting um, soon an exchange program with some schools in Europe. So it's really expanding our relationships to colleagues there at the Hochschule für Musik in Lübeck and also for the uh, Regional Conservatory in Versailles, France. So we're very excited about how our students are going to have relationships with those schools and professors 
and how we will benefit from them coming here, their students. So that's just an exciting, um, a very exciting possibility. I'm excited about symposiums and festivals that can bring in alumni and professional organists, not only uh, our young aspiring organists for the Summer Academy, but at a very high professional level as well. Um, we have the opportunity now to engage in that. So. Yeah, and you know, I'd, I'd like to see more alumni have the kind of experience that I've had of coming back and oh, just uh, uh, being inspired all over by these, by these instruments. And uh, uh, one thing that I really missed in my time away from Oberlin is the concept of winter term, of taking a month and just focusing on a project that you've always wanted to do. And I'd like to see uh, our alumni be able to do something like a winter term project in whatever month uh, at Oberlin and come here, live here for a month, have access to the instruments, maybe play a recital at the end of it um, and, and just uh, come here and be inspired, be refreshed, be reinvigorated and, uh, and, and share our collection. Yeah, kind of like an organ retreat. Yes. You know, and just yes. invite people to come. We've had that on a, a few occasions. We've had some people come and live here for a week and just practice and play. And, you know, we need to, we need to do that. Yeah. More available. This collection belongs as much to Oberlin as it does to the world. And, and just one five steps back to the previous discussion. What, what is my job? What do I do? I feel as I'm almost as much an ambassador for just, making sure that people can get in and see wherever you are if you're an alum if you're just a person who loves the pipe organ and and, and wants wants to hear and see more come here by all means yes i mean i think of my own journey i i heard of oberlin and i knew people who had gone here um my Organ teacher at Peabody Conservatory, Donald Sutherland, of course, studied with Arthur Poister. So it was this, I feel like in one sense, I've made a journey home in a, in a pedagogical way uh, to a place that has impacted so many lives and so many musicians. And uh, we just want to invite everyone to Oberlin, no matter where you've come from, no matter what the age is. Um, Oberlin is a place that you can come to and be inspired by its collection, by its instruments, and continue to just spread the word about what a remarkable place this is. Okay. Well, John, thanks for having us. Well, hey, <laughs> this has been such a great conversation. Um, very informative as always, and really nostalgic. <laughs> Welcome to Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. We are standing in the center of Tappan Square, the geographic center of both the college and the town of Oberlin. This square is at the heart of one of the nation's leading liberal arts colleges, the oldest continuously operated school of music in the United States, and is home to the world's most distinguished collection of pipe organs. Around this beautiful square, designed by noted American landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted is situated a gathering of pipe organs that represents over 500 years of organ building practice. A walk around this square allows one to explore the fullest range of music for the organ, traveling through time and space, as it were, without ever leaving Oberlin. Long recognized as one of the world's leading centers for organ instruction, Oberlin Conservatory has graduated musicians who have become professors of music, church musicians, university organists and scholars, and winners of national and international awards. At the center of their development were the guiding voices of teachers and these remarkable instruments. So join us now as we invite you to experience the organs of Oberlin.
So it's been great to share this time with the both of you and uh, everyone tuning in and our students this week at the Academy. Um, we're so excited about the future of this, this project, but we wanna share one more um, little secret to an Oberlin education. And if you come to Oberlin, um, this, this will fuel you for the rest of your life. And it is brought here by Professor Rakic. One of her she uncle. holds the key in her hand and she's gonna reveal that to you now. Behold, the Powerball. <laughs> many gifts there's the great gift to all of us and that she loves to bake and her oh i do blessed. it's my downfall she she announced to everyone i'm so glad to be back and i i i'm also very glad to share with you that one of my favorite forms of procrastination after practice is baking mm -hmm. and then she handed out cookies and power balls <laughs> So if you come to Oberlin, not only will you fill your heart with music, but will fill your stomach too. Food for the soul. Great. <laughs> Bye.